Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rocket Lasso Live, the weekly show every Wednesday, at least for a gigantic chunk of the year, where I answer Cinema 40 questions in front of a live audience of Twitch people and YouTube people. So they are starting to get some questions rolling in. We already did a little intro and said hello. Now, I just want to do some quick news here. Share the screen quickly. First of all, I just released another tutorial yesterday. If you haven't checked it out, you totally should. I will link it below. It is all about creating these low poly looks inside of cinema using just the built-in modifiers and deformers. And I think there's a lot of really cool potential. So you should definitely check that one out. I really like it. And in addition to that, actually, now I, now I think about it, I created 26 different unique looks and I put them all as a scene file on Patreon. So if you want to check that out and reverse engineer and see how I put together all these very you know, all these different look because we don't cover literally every single one in the tutorial but yeah i've got that file available and i was, <laughs> took a long time to recreate them because i didn't originally plan on giving that file out um so that's one thing and the next thing is next week i'm going to have a guest on the show i haven't had a guest in a little while and the guest is going to be gavin shapiro shapiro 500 you probably know his work from just around the internet and on this live stream i often get questions about his work about how we might be able to recreate it. So something like these looping flamingo animations is always really cool looping camera animations. So you should definitely give him a follow. I'll put a link below for that and prepare to ask questions of Gavin when he's a guest next week. So I'm really looking forward to that one. And I've got a couple other ideas for guests to join. So that should all be very good. Now uh, we're already sharing the screen. So why don't we jump into Cinema 4D S22 and start clicking some links. Ah. Uh, uh, Aku, is there any way to loop hair simulations? Um, that's a good question. If I were to want to loop a hair animation, how might I do it? Uh, there, it goes to a lot of things where simulations are very kind of inherently difficult to loop. So uh, I wasn't really planning on tackling that one except to say it would be tricky. But uh, I don't know. I'm kind of intrigued. Maybe we'll spend a second and see if we can figure out a way. I have some. And we'll do a simple version. In specifically, I mean, what if we just throw the hair on a sphere? So we have that. We can run the hair simulation. It probably probably be a good idea to display in the editor the actual hair lines. This is how many there are. I don't think we need quite that many. 50,000 right now, so we'll simplify simplify that a bit. Editor, we can crank that up to 100. So this is literally every single hair, the way it's going to look in the end. And that's fine right there. Now, essentially, the main thought I have, one would be you have to kill off all the forces so it returns back to its original state, and that would take some time. And... So along those lines, I don't know how long it'll take, but let's just say you let that settle in. So let's just say that's fine, that's settled. And then at a certain point, now under forces, we have all these different forces. So if right at this, this exact moment, I keyframed gravity, and let's just do a very harsh keyframe it down to zero, suddenly there will be no gravity, and these hairs will start going back to their initial, they will start approaching back to their original position just because that's their natural state so we'll see the gravity take over here and it could do whatever and eventually given enough time these will all drift back but you're gonna have all this overshoot and it's gonna take a long time for them to slowly return to their position having said that there's a good chance that if we modify a couple of properties here under properties the main one i'm thinking would be drag Drag is going to stop the overshoot from happening. So the more drag that we have, the more likely it is to quickly get back to its original spot. But I have to say, maybe even that drag is preventing it from doing the last little bit of moving because you see these still look a little bit curved. If I jump back, you'll see there's definitely a little bit of a pop there. So that is going to limit that for sure. Now, we do have a cache. Unfortunately, every cache in cinema behaves a little bit differently. So in this case, let's just do 90 frames worth of a cache. And we won't do these keyframes this time. So let's see what happens with a cache. Because certain things you can kind of uh, do a loop from the cache. But I'm not sure if hair would be one of those. So that should be a calculated cache, which means I should be able to scrub here. At any given moment, we can see all the different hairs. Mm, 
So update frame editable. Yeah, this doesn't really have a time remapping where we could jump back to a different time. Now, what, see, this is a tricky one because the main thing I'm thinking would be some sort of, let me, actually, let me see if anybody in the chat could bake here, make a motion clip and then, can you bake, can you make a motion clip out of the hair? Cause that's kind of what I was talking about where you could use a, you could morph back to the original time, but they all behave a little bit differently. And okay, nobody seems to have a specific one. Yeah, so yeah, a generic way as uh, like Pixel Brain is saying is you could you could hit play and then you know essentially play it forward and then play it in reverse and get back to that same place. That's not as nice as the idea of being able to morph directly from one state to another, and that's kind of where my head is at right now. Now there's a little bit of danger depending on what you're doing with it. Because what my thought is, is instead of, instead of generating hairs, what if instead we generated splines? So I'm going to say generate as guides. And let's see if, I don't even know if this will be possible. But let's generate splines. So these are actual splines now. You can actually see them. So those are splines. I believe we probably can still bake those. I don't know for sure. So let's try that. Cache. Calculate. And okay, that does seem to yeah it seems like we can bake those so those are now baked now i don't know if this will work i'm going to make a copy of the hair and make it editable so that is a copy of the hair in its original state and uh, let's just call that the base and we'll call this one the morph and then this one is the live one let's see if we can do this actually mm, I think we learned recently, well, a couple, you know, some episodes back that the morph tag does not work with splines, which is a real shame. Yeah, that's a real shame. The Let's just try very quickly. I don't think it's going to work. I'm going to try a pose morph. And in the pose morph, I want to control the points directly. Mm, that's the pose. I'm going to say I wanted to be able to go to the hair as an absolute object. So if I hit play, keep in mind. So that's the hair moving. If I were to hide that, we want to see this hair moving and you see it's not moving. Let's make sure that we go to animate and now we've got this hair slider and that should make it morph over. But I think it just goes to, you cannot morph splines. So if we can't morph splines, let's try doing the espresso method, which I don't know if it will work, especially with this not being editable, but there's a chance. So we'll give it a try. So right clicking on it, we can create the programming, programming tags, Espresso. Give that a moment for that window to pop up. We need a couple of things. First of all, being our morph and outputting from that will be the object. What do we want to feed into? Well, I want to get the points. So here, is the point object and it comes from the general tab. So this is the object and these are all of the points. So I'm fine, that's good. Then you can see that we can set the point index and we can also set the point position. Can we get that from a live hair object? That's a big question right now. So if I were to drag this in and essentially do the same thing, can I get the hair objects points and it, you, ah, it turns yellow that's bad there's still does the correction deformer work with splines i don't know oh man it doesn't seem to all of my all the tricks i would usually do on to morph geometry are not working when it comes to hair Hmm. All right. Now, maybe no, that doesn't work. The morph doesn't work. The spine wrap have a yeah, spine wrap doesn't even have a field fall off, so we can't do that. Can can a hair object be baked down to points? 
hair tags, hair collider, spline dynamics. Like if we cache it, can it be made editable? I don't think so. And then we also have, I don't, can I remember, I can't remember where those tags are moved, but there's just the point caching. But a lot of things just don't seem to want to work with splines. MoGraph cache. Rigging, simulation, tracker. Where the heck is the... Like I said, I can never find the point caching tag. Render loop makes sense. Rigging, maybe. Yeah, point cache there is on the rigging. Um, store the state. Even this, I would, just, I would assume, yeah, it has to be made editable. You can't do it on a parametric object. I don't even know if you can do it on a spline object. If I put this here and so click store. Okay, it does maybe seem to work on a spline, but not on this live spline object. So kind of all of my parametric ways of doing it are not working. So unless they're... Somebody's talking about some sort of plugin and uh, more splines using a matrix. Yeah, I think, I feel like you need to make it editable and clone each hair individually. Otherwise they connect to each other. So yeah, I'm going to kind of call this one as not be, this is not very viable for any way I can think of that is kind of reasonable to explain. Um, I do agree that, you know, there's possibility. Well, here's the limitation just to talk about it. If I were to create a matrix object and set that to object mode and the object will be the spline, it will create a series of matrix objects on each one of these hairs. That's fine. However, if we were to hide everything and now we're just looking at these matrix objects, we could say we want to trace that with a tracer object. So it's got the matrix and I could say I want to connect all elements. The problem you see right away is that each of these will connect the final matrix to the starting matrix of each one of these. So you get this extra line connecting each one. And then if we turn on connect elements, yeah, I think connect elements is pretty much identical. There's no break between segments and there's no way to force that to work properly. And I've never found any way around it. It would be amazing if it did, but it does not. And yeah, there's no way to stop that from happening. So even though this could result in you getting kind of those hairs and they're being traced by a matrix and you'll see them actually bend, those have actually translated. You see that each one gets interconnected and that's why that's why it's not going to work. And that's why I was saying, I think you'd have to, each hair would have to be its own rig with its own matrix, with its own tracer. And that obviously is not something that's terribly viable. Um, and you could, I mean, because, you know, this is just a hair. This is just... This hair is just returning a spline right now. There are additional options. You get maybe like a Mo spline could potentially trace it. A sweep could potentially trace it. If we'd made that geometry, then maybe we could do my morphs between. But once it's geometry and not splines, I feel like it'd get really ugly. So yeah, um, I have a lot of tricks that do that type of thing. However, hair just doesn't seem to be one of them. Anyway, let us jump in and see if, yeah, Monthies, it can sample the hair spline, but it's, it doesn't give us any baking possibility or morphing. There's not like crossfade between one shape and another. Um, let's see. Peer has a question. How would you do this mixing thing? That worries me. We're about to see some sort of advanced particle simulation. Yeah, that's pretty much what I'm thinking we're seeing here. Let's take a look. This is from Obsident. Obsident? From the editable, edible, sorry, edible series. Um, so it is X particles, which implies it's cinema. Bloop. I like how the container is even blobbing over there. Um... I mean, this is a particle simulation. In a lot of ways, I mean, there's a little bit of... 
stuff seemingly to move a little bit. And I guess they're, they're not really feeling mixing very much. Like there's a couple of kind of colors in here that are like a little bit red, but I don't feel like that's coming from a specific mixing. You see that like a red streak didn't follow it over there. So that might be something that's, uh, those are mimula. I've had those, those are tasty. Um, so then you just get these kind of different blobby layers. I mean, it's, it's, the amount of effort it would take to do this via a particle simulation could be pretty crazy. It could be very involved. I wonder to what degree we could do a very, very basic version of keeping all the layers completely separate. A, let's see, what's my approach going to be? Let us create a floor that will be dynamic. This is not, uh, I'll say right now, this is not going to look amazing by the end. But let's give it a go. A new sphere with a radius of 10, moving the floor minus 5. So it should, oops, I'm sorry, minus 10. So it's sitting exactly on the floor. That will become dynamic. A rigid body, which gets fed into a cloner. That cloner can be a honeycomb array, which is laying flat on the ground. The spacing is, I always get a little lost on the spacing, but I want to see this hex pattern. And I think we want the second number. Yeah, we want the second number to be double the first. Uh, they're intersecting each other for sure. So we'll just eyeball it. I want to spread these out, but fill up the volume as much as possible. Sort of like that. So you see we have pretty tight shape of them all combining. So we can feed in as many of these as we need to. When it comes to this type of hex pattern, you need to go almost double the number on one to get it square. It's just the way they're laid out. Now, we could say that the form is of a circle, and yeah, it's going to create kind of a circle shape. That's getting a, us a little bit more along the lines of where we were just looking. This is just a really good way of filling a volume. In fact, just to keep things simple for us, I'll leave it square. So it's filling up this entire space. And this seems like a reasonable-ish amount of them. So that's the basic idea. They're all dynamic. If I hit, well, let's make sure that this dynamic tag on sphere is calculating as a ellipsoid. So they're calculated as spheres. We can tell the cloner to calculate these as multi instances. So that's going to maximize the speed there. And now you see we have a dynamic clutter, uh, cluster. And actually, the uh, sets for frame are not too bad. So maybe we can try and create two layers here, although I don't know that we will. Now that we have that, I want to trap it inside of some sort of space. Uh, it can be circular. In fact, um, yeah, we'll do a cylinder. Why not? So I'll create a cylinder here, make it pretty much infinitely tall. That will be the shape I want to trap inside. My typical workflow here would be creating a mm, display, no, render, render tag. A render tag display and use line shading so that just becomes a cage we can see through that will become a collider body i'll steal a tag from the floor and to make sure that this is a static mesh so it's inside and now this is really simple these are all just trapped inside of that cylinder shape so now the main thought is we want to fill this up quite a bit honestly we we could have actually maybe putting this back to circle is not a bad thing and stretch that to fill it up pretty well, something like that. Now, I don't want to actually literally fill up the entire space like completely because I want there to be able to be some gaps. So this might be too much there. That's a little bit better as far as like how much spacing there is. Now, stretch to the entire timeline, a copy of the cylinder, deleting the display tag, no height segments, a radius of 55. No, let's drop to 24. Yeah, that's pretty good. And a vibrate tag, just to give us some random animation. Uh, how big is this cylinder? 300-ish. Mm, so I think we can go up to 555, 555 on X and Z. So that will collide a little bit, but oop, and it's way fast. 0.25, thank you very much. Okay, so this should start stirring around. And the hope here is it will leave a cleared out trail anywhere it's moving. Now, these can pile up on top of each other, depending on the way you're treating this as some sort of liquid simulation. 
that could be fine or maybe you don't want it to so something we could do i'll do the very very basic version create a cube in this case and scoot it up until it's floating just above it make it big enough then steal this tag from the cylinder and make sure that that is calculating as a box which is pretty accurate and i can use the same collider tag so we can see that we have a blocker there if it's working those should be trapped and they can't pop above each other there's a, always a chance they can escape up through there but it's, it's working all right these are trapped on the ground pretty well so now this will stir around and obviously just by its stirring it will leave sort of a gap behind and as it pushes these those will fill in the other areas because there's obviously only so much space the ability for these to slow down stylistically is going to go a long way. So something like under force, giving it a lot of linear damping and probably angular damping as well. This is now enabling it to get pushed away, but you'll see they'll stop moving quite quickly. They're not going to start rolling and bouncing all over the place. So now you see the trail. These don't have too much momentum to them. It gets drained very quickly. So now you see we get the single layer of all of these just getting stirred around a little bit. And we get that little bit of, an, of, of a nice gap that can be filled in. Of course, we can put as many of these as we want by increasing this even by one and one. That's going to fill that space in a lot more. And depending on how much we really squeeze in there, there won't be much space left over. So those trails will start getting filled back in again, depending on what you're doing. Who knows what the specific end result is you want. But now you see that we're getting a decent a decent trail getting pushed through, but eventually it gets closed. All right. Um... That's working nicely. Uh, in theory, just for fun, I could make a dynamic force, and I, hopefully this won't go too slow, but what the force does is it's kind of like particle-to-particle -particle interactions. They all get attracted or repulsed from each other. So this should make them want to either... Yeah, it's a lot slower, so we'll just do this for a moment. But what this is going to do is either make them want to group up or push apart from each other. I think to push apart, we'll have to put a negative number. So I shall say a negative 10. And as soon as I do these... Dude, do you see how they're all seeming to spread out a little bit more? And now by having this force in the scene, the gaps in here are going to start trying to close themselves up. Now, in the spheres, I never want them to fall asleep. So under dynamics, turn off the activation. So they'll all always be calculating. And you see how they're starting to spread out from each other. Now, it does seem like... Um, yeah, I guess they're all pushed away from the center point. So now that I think about it, we don't want the radius of that being very large. Each of those is only 10. So I think an inner distance of 10 and an outer distance of maybe two spheres worth will give us a better number there. Because I don't want everything getting repulsed from everything so much that the entire thing... Um, doesn't uh, organize itself. But now you can see as this moves away, they're going to be inclined to slide into that gap depending on the strength of this. Let's go overboard, so I'll say 100. And that should very strongly be closing in behind it. So th this might leave a little bit of a trail and then you'll see it will get sealed in behind it. And depending on the strength that we feed in, that could be a cool way of, of letting that close up again. So just throwing that out there, obviously it's doing a lot of calculations all over the place, so it's really slowing us down. So I will keep it off, but keep that in mind. All right, now that we have the basics here, let's save this into episode 30, scene files, file 1A. Mm. Let's just say dynamic stirring. And of course... Uh, if you are supporting on Patreon, you can get access to all these scene files if you like reverse engineering. That's the way I love to learn. All right, so a good obvious place to go here would be a volume builder and a volume mesher. Throwing the cloner into the builder, it should try and blob all these. Actually, we turned on... It was fine here, but we turned on multi-instance and the volume can't see that, so we have to turn that off. And now... The volume will be able to see these each as their own little individual blob filling in the space. And you can see we end up with the gap behind. Currently, the voxel size is 10. The spheres right now technically are a radius of 10. So it should be seeing them all individually. I Something I it's not unusual for me to do would be to make a single extra one here. And I'll just take this sphere and maybe move it over off to the side. And we turn that on. We can see what the result of that single sphere is. You see it's actually not that much detail. And just for our sanity, 
turn off the main one. And you'll see as I move this, do you see how like the blob is going to dramatically change its form as it moves around in space? That's just the way the volume calculates. It's creating very specific things saying if something exists in this grid space or not. So this is actually not that much detail. Yes, it technically always exists, but anything smaller that we do, any, oh, not that radius, any radius we shrink in the volume builder is going to increase the quality of the shape here. The best would be, I mean, the number I'd love to go to would be double the amount. Let's just try dropping it down to eight. Let's just see how much more kind of spherical that is. Already you can see that's maintaining the volume a lot better. Um, the best one, as I said, would be five. And now you can see it actually is taking on a little bit of a spherical look and it's pretty consistent frame to frame. Of course, that is a lot of extra voxels getting generated, which of course translates to this entire blob is going to take a lot more time. You can also, because it is more accurate, these are, you can make out the individual spheres a lot better, which is also not necessarily a good thing. If we were doing that, and this is going to go way too slow, maybe we can render to the, um, the viewport. I'd probably be inclined to dilate, which is expanding it. I'm inflating it with this dilate and erode. So that's going to expand those out and they blob into each other more. And now that that has happened, I could create the SDF smooth and all of the smoothing happens and now they blob in. But you do end up with a problem if you push this too far that the individual dots will disappear. So really, this is, a, this is some sort of balancing act of how much, did, how much do you want to expand it and then how much do you want to smooth it. Now, for our purposes right now, I don't know how well it will work, but if I keep on just pushing this until we can't see them individually anymore, so 50% actually, I guess just we're working with clean numbers, so at 50%, I cannot tell where one starts and the other one begins. So maybe that's a happy medium for us creating a, let's just create some sort of material that can show up differently. We could say that this was some sort of honey. I won't worry about transparency right now because we're just doing a viewport renderer. Um, and actually along those lines, yes, we can do a viewport render, saving this control B, control or command B. We'll do a square. Actually, yeah, we will do that. I'll lock the ratio. So Instagram, but I'll do it 50%. So, so I can store more images in Ram. Don't worry about saving it. Render at all frames. I want a viewport renderer, which is the new setting that we have in S22. And we can make that look nice, but I just want to copy the effects from the viewport and load a preset, just one of my own presets, so like the grid and everything stays off. Anyway, that's just giving that is just going to give us a nice viewport renderer. Frame up on that thing a little bit better, and let's see if this gives us anything decent and what kind of gap is left in there. So I'd expect it, it's not gonna look great in the beginning because it's, I, the stick should come in from the outside and it said it's already intersecting a few. But actually that's not, I mean, when we run this at real time, maybe it will look amazing, but that's actually not too bad right now. There, um, there's a little bit of a gap in between all of them. So they haven't, they're not being forced back in that path right away. I do feel like a little bit of oozing might be justified. And I mean, that goes back to us having that force turned on, but we obviously saw that drops from like running 60 frames a second down to like two frames a second. So that obviously can have a large effect. We've got about three seconds rendered here. Okay, and when it's in real time, you can, you can start seeing this is like pushing those parts away. We can, as they spread out, we do get a little bit of a gap. So maybe a little bit more smoothing on there would be justified. But now you can see how we have a single kind of flat layer of these being able to blob around and do their own thing. Along those lines, I wonder just out of curiosity to what degree we could push this so that we have like two different color blobs in here. They wouldn't mingle, but you could kind of picture an oil and water type of situation. So yeah, let's see what we could do there. I'll let that keep rendering. But the thought would be what if we created a second sphere? I'm sorry, a second cloner. Turn off the volume. The second cloner, I will limit to, I don't know, let's say 11, 11. So you see there's just this blob in the center. Those will intersect with each other a lot. I'm trying to think of what the best way to do this would be. 
because you can't really, I could erase out a section there, but I'm trying to think of a quick way because I don't, it's not that important. But if we were to make a, eh, I'll just leave it there. It might not look amazing. The point being is we could create an entirely second volume measure and that second volume measure could see this secondary sphere. We don't need those spheres. And that could be fed a red material for the Nimola. And yeah, there's a redder blob there. And we can turn this on. So we have those two blobs and they will fight each other and push each other out of the way. They're getting fed the same effects. I don't think we, yeah, we can't grab more than one, unfortunately. So I'll just grab this one. Can we smooth it more? 60%? Yeah, I'll just do a 60% smooth on it. Why not? Oh, and this one, I gotta make sure it goes down below those shapes. There we go. So this is a red blob. Now, as soon as this begins, those will suddenly spread out and they should be tight enough to blob, but they'll probably intermix a little bit. I intentionally kept this rendering so we can stop this and just see what the end result of that kind of blobbiness is. Yeah, it's not bad for kind of what we're just throwing at this. You can imagine putting extra textures or some sort of displacement on it. And I think we can get something pretty nice. And considering how consistent the surface, this surface is, I wouldn't be surprised if you could get away, and actually, why don't we do it? We'll stop that. I wouldn't be surprised if we can get away with a nice little bit of displacement as well that could be consistent. It would be like a coherent displacement. Now, it should be a pretty high poly count. It's not the craziest poly count. However, if we put in a noise. We can get all of this displacement on that surface. This noise could be something a little more delicious looking like Naki and scale that way up. So there, now you can see we get these little imperfections that have a little bit more consistency to them. And this is a big three dimensional noise. So of course our blob will pass through that. I don't know if this will look good or not, but that's kind of interesting. I'll lower it down to five and that should give us this little texture variation. I just want to see how consistent that is because we have it trapped so specifically. And yeah, let's give that a go. I do want a different random seed on the, uh, on the stick because it wasn't getting near the middle and I would like to see it get near the middle. So vibrate tag, seed, whatever. Zero it out. All right, so yeah, it's gonna start in the middle. I actually don't want it in the middle, I want it right there. So let's just give this a few frames. Now, like I said, these are already intersecting each other, so that's probably gonna like force the other ones out of the way. Let's just see what happens. Yeah, those are gonna start out by exploding and they have to sort themselves out. That's, that's expected. And because they spread out, like the uh, the very nature of the way we're telling the stuff to spread out, those are there's not very much of it. And why does the uh, our stir bar end up way over off to the side? Um, I guess the good news is that this um, the texture on the surface is actually doing a pretty nice job overall. Now, why? in the viewport. Oh no, it did jump off to the side. Why would it do that? All right, we'll put that into a group and move the group there. No, nope, it still jumps over there. I think you thought that um, relative, is that what uh, the problem is? Yeah, I think maybe, nope, still jumping back there. Uh, okay, uh, I, I, I wanna use the vibrate tag. The vibrate tag is not gonna cooperate, so let's use signal. Signal is a plugin from Grayscale Gorilla that I developed. And it's just going to give us vibrate like controls without us having to worry about, well, we can just control it very well. So I'm gonna say, I want to drive the position scale rotation of the stick. I want to drive it with noise. And here's the X, Y, and Z. So I want it to be driven on 500 on X, 500 on Z at a speed of 0.5. And now it's it's just going to behave. It's actually starting where I told it to. Well, it's going to start near the middle, and I have the ability to change the strength over time, so I could fade into that position, that random position, over the first ninety frames. So, and I could even say over the first twenty-five frames. So there we go. Just uh, gives us a nice control there. 
Um, there's plenty of space here, so just so we see more of our blob, I'll give us a few more of this red. Let's jump it up to 14 by 14. Okay, neat. Um, save that, and we'll send that out to the picture viewer. Still going to require those few frames for the initial kind of explosion where they're all intersecting. And then, yeah, I guess it maybe would need to inflate a little bit more. But at least those are moving more the way I wanted it to. I could have started outside of the shape as I should have. But let's just see if the path looks okay. And I just want to see how the uh, displacement works on the overall surface. That could be good. Now, in the reference, we also saw that the container was warping. But given the setup that we have, we could deform the cylinder shape that we're in. So the shape of this could spread out. I'm just trying to keep this out of the kind of chaotic world of pushing a lot of particles around. Right now we've built a rig that we should have very direct control over. These swirls are fun, but the way they space out, we probably need, need it to be a little bit more inflated. We'd like to give it a few frames, but obviously this takes time to calculate. Uh, let's see if there's any. Let's see if there's any questions I can answer just by talking, and let this still calculate. Any bridge R20 plugins to use in S22? What do you mean by bridge? Get the bridge. Um, unnamed. I should be able to. As long as I'm at the time of zero, I should be able to move it regardless of dynamics and it's not it's a collider body so that shouldn't be a variable on it at all um <laughs> mw it uh yes however i don't uh, i don't get any money from that so it doesn't do me any good um show techniques for basic 3d motion graphics uh sculptor i'm can you be more specific um I don't, I mean, like basic motion graphics, but that could mean a lot of different things to different people. So um, if you're a little more specific, that would help. Uh, yeah, well, it's traveling around the uh, perimeter there, which isn't helping us visually. Splat. I mean, the general stirring, I like the look of it. Um, in the viewport, let's um, stop that. I would love to, let's turn off the volumes for just a moment and let the initial bit calculate. So, and honestly, it should go back to running quite nicely. So we'll let that happen and they do the spread out. And you see how this is still packed in quite tightly. And because there are so many, that's why this trail can't be very long. I will give us a different random seed. And let's not push out quite as far. And we can go more extreme, give it a little bias. So um, what I was going to say is now that we see these blobs, if I turn on the volume, you see that this actually turns very thin. And I like how it's smoothed out. But I wonder, this is not something I typically do, but in the volume builder, we inflated it and then we smoothed it. But what if we inflate it again afterward? So let's do another dilate. And now you see it gets huge. Um, that should be up here. Okay, yeah, look at that. So after the fact, we can have those reinflate again. And that actually fills in the spacing quite nicely. So here it is without that. And here it is inflated again. That's kind of nice. Let's try putting that in our other volume. Add a second. I hold down control. No, it's the controls. The interface is a little different. So you can't just hold down control and make a duplicate. But I will create a second dilate in the road. Inflate that as well. So that fills in those gaps. And that should just have everything be a little bit uh, a little bit nicer. Fill in all of the extra space. Turn that on for some texture. And mm, let's decrease our count by two. One. Uh, I should probably rewind. And it's you know everything's going to struggle as it refreshes. I'll turn that off for a moment. We'll decrease the count here. Come on. Decrease the count by two so that there's a little bit more space for the stirring to happen. And that should be all right. And turn that back on again. Save this as a second version of itself. Bing, bing, bing. 
And there we go, that looks all right. And send to the picture viewer again. Um, let's see, like from the news channel. Oh, okay, um, yeah, you mean like a, like a news channel infographic. I mean, there's, unfortunately there's not, Every time we see anything from a sports graphic or a news graphic where it's kind of like the station ident flying in, I'm trying to think. There are universal ideas in there, like things that you're going to commonly see, almost like tropes, common stylistic things that they do. And, you know, they, they, they are common and stylistically similar because you want it to read very quickly to a viewer. It's like, oh, this is what it is. This is a station identification type of thing. So you want that in that way. Um, um, it's a fairly, it's a big question because a lot of that turns into the entire world of reflections. You need to be reflecting things in a lot of transparency, refraction, possibly blurry reflections and, uh, no, I'm sorry, blurry transparencies always look like really slick. And you need to spend a lot of time setting a very nice looking lighting for those those setups so while there are things we could do and tinker around the specifics matter and it's like to make one nice station identification type of animation i would say we'd probably need to spend the entire two hours to get something sort of working and we even that you need a concept a lot of them are like oh it's a football identification but everything's very robotic it's like okay and i imagine this is the way it would go from a client pitch the client says all right we want to see the football helmet, but it's going to be in this environment with all this text and it should feel like when Iron Man's suit is first going on. So there, that's kind of the pitch on that. But it could be very, but the pitch could be completely different where they're like, oh, we want everything to feel very clean and Apple-like with lots of white reflections and and glass. Like that's the look we want. And something else could be like very dark and sharp and dangerous feeling. So it's more... To generically say like, oh, a motion, like motion graphics, like, yeah, but most of the work in there turns into how is it combined with what the client was actually looking for? And that kind of stuff is, it's non-trivial. There's a lot to do there. Um, I'll think about it. Maybe that's something to tackle in a bigger way in the future. Um, I'm not sure it's great for the live stream, especially not with a little bit more prep, but let's uh, get a new question going. And or a, a new, I'll try and do a start a new proper segment here. Let's see what we've ended up with. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Ooh, nice and speedy in some spots. That's the uh, bias for you. But yeah, these are inflated. Inflating after the fact is pretty good. They some of them are kind of popping in and out of existence. So I guess that's maybe a downside to that technique. But them being reinflated is pretty neat. That's not a bad stirring. I can think of a lot of ways of potentially approaching this, but this isn't bad. It's the start of something neat. And them all being trapped in this flat area is um, pretty cool. Hmm. Trying to think of anything I might do differently here. I mean, unfortunately, it goes to it would be the same with if you're doing it with particles. There's just sort of an inherent resolution to things. Right now, we're using spheres, and that's fine. And the spheres are calculating dynamically, accurately. But if we wanted to look more detailed and not have these big gaps and just have everything feel like it has a higher resolution, then we just have to increase the number of spheres. But it turns into if you make the spheres half the radius, you get the the cube law. So we'd actually need, if you make it half the radius, I think we need four times as many spheres. Maybe eight, but possibly four. If, if, we, were two, if we were three-dimensional, right now we're in a two-dimensional world. If we were three-dimensional, we'd need eight times as many spheres to fill in the same space. And that's where that kind of stuff gets really dangerous. The same concept applies in just the volume builder in general, where as we, if we cut this scale in half, we are creating... I think eight times as many calculations. So that's why that can dramatically take longer as we go. Mm -hmm. 
Possibly there's a completely unrelated version of this where we're just using a vertex map and we can paint our way through the vertex map and it's sort of, uh, I guess it wouldn't forget, it couldn't push back in again. That's unique to what we're doing here, but it could slowly fade out. So this could be stirring around and a plane could be displacing upward and kind of sticking up through something to create the effect. Possibly things popping in and out of existence. Yeah, that, that's conceptually interesting. I like it. Uh, I guess I'll just keep that going until we've picked out our next question. Hmm. Sid, make popcorn. So, like, a, you mean like the idea of a kernel popping into a kernel, or like a full popped bit of corn? Maybe. Um. Ooh, that seems dangerous. Uh, Michael asking about IV dynamics. IV dynamics? At, whoa, look at that. Neat. So we are seeing minimum 40. And is this a plugin? Oh, no, it's a random field. First of all, what are we looking at? This is, oh, this is from uh, Rosalind. Um, and he's been for Fazars? I haven't said the name out loud. Ra Rus Ruslan Fuzars? Fuzars? Um, um, they have been creating some really neat little rigs. I think they have a Patreon set up and whatnot, so I don't want to... Procedural, C4D, Inspiration. That's pretty cool. Um... The, um, you gotta be, <sighs> a couple things. First of all, this is really cool. They're putting together very nice work. The specifics really matter here. And I think that they're doing a lot where this, yeah. And even right now they're kind of presenting it as just an experiment. However, I do think that they have a Patreon where they are distributing these types of things. And I don't want to step on somebody else's toes where it's like, oh, they're they're attempting to make a living from this. And I'm going to like say, oh, I'm going to steal it away from them and then show how to do it for free when they're trying to do it on Patreon or something. So that's where I feel a little bit weird about it. Um, mechanically, I mean, he's not linked to a Patreon or anything right here. So it's more of just an exploration. Um, if this is vanilla cinema, the way I like, it's like, is that just a spline? And those are jumping over to the spline. I don't know. There's a, there's it's really cool and I'm not sure. I'm trying to think conceptually because it doesn't seem like it's running any kind of dynamics after the fact. So, yeah, I'm actually a little stumped on that. It's the kind of thing I should think about just uh, how I might go about it. But it's really cool. It's a good question, but yeah, can't um can't think of a way of ch tackling that right now. Um, would it be possible to replicate this effect without simulations? Let's see what we've got. We've got commercial. It's what we've got. I'll pull it over as soon as commercial's done. All right. It looks like we have a gun firing underwater. Oh, man. There's a lot going on there. Could we do this without simulations well you get two main things and i imagine that these will travel upward so once they start traveling upward we very quickly get out of the world of yeah even that yeah you get the it created like a, a pressure wave and it's forcing it outward and then it collapses back in but the speed of that collapsing will create a second void inside of it so you get the cycle i'm actually surprised it's not so they're not traveling upward, but I guess maybe there's no bubbles. This could just be um, areas of uh, low pressure getting left behind. Because you got to think about like the physics of what are actually what is actually going on if you're going to emulate it. One of the main problems is you see that these these are a, a series of separate 
it's it's a series of it's like it's a continuous line but at a certain point these little pockets all collapse by themselves and they're separate and then they start echoing up and down so like in order to i mean even if we we're doing a, even if we were like yes let's do a simulation a lot of what's going on here is not trivial this is from the slow-mo guys not surprising if I were to build a rig that did something like that, how would I go about doing it? Because a lot of it turns into you have to start man very manually animating things. Um, and uh, by let's just take a look at this before we start something like that. I not going to promise we're going to get very far on it, but let's uh, let's take a look. So here's where our goopy stirring ended up. Yeah, I mean, it's goopy stirring. It's working decently, decently well. I'll save this in the uh, render folder. Save animation just as an MP4, nothing fancy. And this can go into episode 30, renders, dynamic stirring. One, B, save. Done. All right. So, not as a simulation is our goal here. So, here's our bullet. Face it on Z because Z forward is a good orientation to have something start moving. This is um, it's probably pretty large. C for scale. Scale it to twenty five percent of its original size. All right. Control D. So I can go to our key interpolation. I'm, going to tell it that all the interpolation should be linear so there's no ease in and ease out as I record keyframes so all I care about is Z we'll have that blast forward so at the time of zero and then it's supposed to be kind of a slow motion effect so we'll hit play and right around there 45 frames in that's fine we'll have the bullet having traveled a pretty decent distance all right so that is the start all right now, how about tracing the object? We'll leave a trail behind it using a tracer. Trace paths, but don't trace the vertices. So now there should be a single line traveling behind it. So nice. Now that that's happening, how about cloning a sphere onto the line? The object shall be the tracer. And we should do order of operations. The tracer comes after the object. The object cloning will come after the tracer. So currently it's cloning onto that spline and it's got a count of 10. So there should be 10 spheres that will stretch out wherever that's going. I think we actually want a step. And the step can be whatever we want. Let's say a step of 200. So it's going to create a sphere every 200. So as it traces, you see new ones get created as it goes. Okay. That's the, uh, that's the start there. Do, 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 do. Now, the spheres should, it's not, they're not getting emitted. So we would need to offset their life. If we were to keyframe them, we need some sort of fall off or Yeah, let's try some sort of fall off. That'll keep it a little bit more in the world of building a rig, which I always like. So here's the thought. What if we make a plane effector and this plane effector will scale everything up? It's going to be a uniform scale in an absolute way, scaling things up. Now, I think that, well, they need to, oh man, this is tricky. Because in the reference, it starts out as a very solid trail. And so a very solid trail, if there's very small spears, what I was going to say is I want these to be born very tiny and then they'll grow quickly. But we actually, in this type of world, we need them to be pretty large at the beginning. Like these should be pretty big so that they blend together. 
but we need to them to scale in as they go. So that immediately is something that's kind of tricky. And but if they're if they're too big or if they're not creating enough of them as they go, then we're going to get this kind of a stepping effect. So you see, ding, 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 you'll see that happen. So then if that doesn't work, the thought goes to, we need a lot more of them. So we can control that. Let's make there be a lot more by dropping this down to 50. So there'll be four times as many large spheres. And I see it feels smoother. So if we were to make them eventually scale down and get that oscillating effect, could we do it with like a formula effect or uh, more, even more controllable than a formula, perhaps a step effector, because a step effector, um, I'm, I don't want to go negative, but let's just say it goes negative here so I can demonstrate. We have a spline, and by controlling this spline, we could potentially do something like this, and that's not bad. These little individual ones are not necessarily what we want. And there'd be a lot of manual keyframing where these would be all the way at the bottom and then they'd spread out. So it's like, I want a space where it's either there or it's not. And all these little in-between ones need to be kind of leveled out. So you can, you can see how I've now reduced a lot of spheres into a larger cluster. But animating these splines like this is not generally a good idea. Now, obviously, fields gives us a lot of options to feed a lot of shapes in as we go. So, yeah, let's try Let's try this. I will make even more spheres. We'll drop this down to 25, twice as many. Should be quite smooth as they're created, but they'll start out pretty small. I don't know how small. Let's, let's say 10. They'll start out really small, but they'll scale up quickly. So they'll get created really small. I do want them intersecting, so let's try 20. So then, like that. And then we, I want the bullet to continue its path. So uh, how far did we travel? We went um, that far. So I'll actually move this twice as far and then double this number. So we'll just go up to a nice clean 5,000. So it's going to go twice as far. And for our, this is, does the path stop here? What is it? Does it eventually give up? What happens with the bullet? I guess well, it's losing a lot of velocity. Uh, I don't. I'm not going to worry about getting everything perfect here. Let's just more talk about concepts. In fact, I want that bullet to keep on traveling through. So I will do a limit from start. Actually, it's probably from end. I always get it backwards. I want to see if that works. I only want it to trace for so far. Yeah. So this is pretty much what I'm going for. So for 45 frames, it'll be tracing, and then it will stop. So I'm only worried about this, but the bullet will continue on forward. So with that in mind, we have a relatively small sphere. And it will get scaled upward as it goes. So the effector, it's got a plane in there. And we see these. So that plane is going to start scaling them upward. You see they start getting larger. And I'll have it, I'll allow it to go up to its maximum distance, which would be something like that, 12 times larger than they started out. That will be controlled via the linear fall off on the z plus axis so as this travels through if we make it large enough we now see that transition happening i suppose we want z minus i don't want the color so no color information thank you very much and this linear field can travel with our bullet so i'll just make that child of the bullet so now as this goes those get born and then they grow up to this larger size so okay fine working well uh, I think maybe out of the gate, a little bit of randomness would be nice. So this plane could probably be fed a random as well. So put a random field in there, which could be maybe an overlay. I'm not sure. Let's see what it ends up being here. Yeah, by adding this randomness, we can see that we start getting a little variation in the way those are growing. Hmm, could be could be a neat little something. Actually, yeah, that's adding quite a bit of variation. I don't mind that. So it's getting up to that final scale quite quickly. Now that scales up to a big end scale. If I were to... Uh, Leo, they could be, but that's not what the reference shows. So we will not make them a Taurus. 
So that is expanding. And I'd want that to be pretty smoothly, like kind of scaling up and not stopping, but we can put in some sort of smoothing effect after the fact. So would I want to, I guess we could start adding in just more layers of things to erase this out. So perhaps we could create a folder. Well, that's kind of a pain. It looks like this random field cannot be, <laughs> now it allowed it, this is very clunky. The folders, I, there's some weirdness with the way the folders behave. Uh, moving the folder up, that could be a multiplier on top of everything below. So we can feed in whatever fields that we want inside of said folder. And if we add them together, they can be then subtracted. So that will be normal. And this all multiplies, which would e that's essentially the only place where it can be. The alternative would be that this is adding to it. Yeah, that, yeah, I guess multiplying is going to remove it. So these are areas that get removed. This spherical field could get a full range of fall off and it needs to be relatively large so we can see the transition happen. It has to be large enough. To, it has to be bigger than the sphere to be able to do the transition. So the idea here is that only where these are showing, those are there. So maybe we need to invert. I don't know. It, some of the stuff gets complex. If I were to say I want to invert that, yeah, so we end up with this end result. So this has actually become something that erases them out, which is actually more of what I wanted. So now we still have this initial like that flying out. And then we could start having these transition in to particular spots and erasing out particular areas. This spherical field scale could be larger and it could have a more of an inner in the spherical field. It could have a little bit of inner, so it's going to erase out that part. Now we are starting at a scale of not zero. So I cannot shrink these beyond that point using a single plane effector. That becomes an absolute minimum. So I suppose what it's our alternative. I could make this like way smaller, a tenth as small. So they would still technically be there, but they're gonna be really tiny. And then this would have to scale them up. 120 to be the same scale, but now you see that's pretty well erased. Let's just make sure it looks approximately correct. So as that travels in, yeah, it still looks the same. But now as this fades up, those can shrink down like that. And we have very nice control over that. And you could even control this curvature. That becomes very linear. However, we could add a curve to that. And now those will smooth out a little bit. And I think that goes a long way. So the um, idea of this plane or yeah this plane is being fed that sphere which gets inverted that means we could add several of those so creating a second sphere we can make as many of these as we want and place them anywhere that we want and as long as it lives inside of this folder and we add it to the previous one then these become a series of fall offs of any type that we want anywhere we want of any size that we want and those become transition points that we can move into position we could scale them up but we could also just move them up it doesn't have any effect until it the sphere the actual origin of the sphere passes through so we could shrink those like that and actually move these around and get whatever scale we want and once you know as all of this is happening we would have to manually keep from keyframe those in it does seem to work and we can um make pretty I'm, I'm not i don't want to spend all the time doing all the keyframing we're kind of doing the technical end it would um take a lot of time to actually do all the final keyframes uh radius i am intrigued do tell how you think you uh did pose more splines because i've tried that several times and I haven't ended up with any good result. Anyway, I want this cloner to go into the volume builder. Actually, okay, that worked, but it was a little dangerous because our scale is relatively large here. But you can see those have blobbed in quite nicely. If we look at our mesh density, it's quite high. So this probably doesn't need to be nearly as detailed. Yeah, that's pretty good. Maybe even more 30. So we can let those blob up quite a bit. And now we get this nice big blob. That becomes the end result there. We saw in the surface here that there's a lot of there's a lot of texture to them, especially once they implode. They seem quite smooth in this initial part. Not totally. But you see that seems fairly smooth. Um, this initial part obviously had more force. But 
keep in mind, let's use a plane effector. Yeah, I'll use a plane effector. I'm going to create a new plane effector, which we will rename plane the deformer. And let's see. Give me one moment. Radius is trying to send the message for how they approached. Oh, the class. Okay, well, I accepted. Hey, Radius, I did accept the message, so you should be able to send more if you want. Uh, okay, this plane deformer is going to behave exactly like a displacer, except it calculates technically a little quicker. And we can use effectors for it. So by feeding this in to the volume measure, telling it to behave as a deformer, immediately we see it do something. It's actually not what we want. That's pushing out on Y. I want to push out on Z. So you see it's inflating, which is fine for there. However, if we go into the fall off, turn on random, then now it's treating these as random. And the further that we tell the plane to push on Z, the more that will deform. And the noise that we feed in via this random field controls the, the way that that looks. And it's really cool because we can do things like remap that noise and get more contrast. So you get more like take these lower areas and perhaps peak them. Yeah, so we get a little bit more spiky there. And visually, of course, this is very dependent on the poly counts that we feed in. So if I were to lower that, you can see those become more detailed and you get all those nice funky spiky effects. And that's an independent shape that could be animated. It can be pa passing through that shape. Um, let's see. So you can maybe see the elements that I'm playing with here to be able to build this type of thing. The actual like keyframing and timing out of this for like a client or the project you're doing, it just turns into the type of timing you want. So the ability to move that in at the exact moment that I want that transition to happen and, you know, it'd create more, shrink them in at this sphere could increase in radius and then shrink in radius to to emulate different effects. This kind of this is kind of the toolbox now for perhaps how I would go about building this. It's not, and I think that's about as far as I'm going to go. Hopefully you can see the ideas behind it. I just want to see if we get any kind of decent playback on the initial thing. No, it's not too bad. I give that a little bit more fall off. It gets pretty big pretty quickly. So I could have a longer fall off as that travels in, but the initial part's not too bad. And I could also see this fall off and not have the effect the entire time as it goes more and more. Obviously, it's slowing down. More points are existing. Pinch that in so it doesn't exist. And it goes further. So yeah, a lot of fun little goodie bag of building a rig. I, I really love the idea of building rigs. Do, 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 do. Um, pull this out so I can see if radius replies. Uh, I appreciate the donation. Uh, kills, have I ever tried Blender? I tried Blender a long time ago and I absolutely hated the interface. They have since way updated the interface and I know it's supposed to be a lot better and it's made a lot of progress for what it's doing. Um, why can't you subscribe? I don't know. Why can't you subscribe? Well, uh, if you're on Twitch, if you're not too familiar with Twitch, subscribing, well, you should be able to subscribe just to follow. That should just work. But then there's also like, um, I forget what it's called. I don't do, I mean, I use Twitch, but I'm not like a big Twitch user in general. Um, but then there's like uh, the subbing, I think, like you sub for a month and it actually costs money. So that's a different thing. Um, oh yeah, uh, Pierre, that's a good idea. I was using a folder. I always do that. I always forget though. I should do it that way. But one last detail on this one, we're feeding in everything as a folder. It'd be a way better idea to create a group field. Group, group, group. Yeah, group field. A group field is, is essentially a folder, but what's better about it in a lot of ways is that it's external to this hierarchy. So I could move the invert and the sphere and the sphere 
and set that to multiply. This folder is now dead, but what's really cool, oops, folder, dead, yes, okay. What's great is uh, anything that I put as a child in this group field, I, is it a child, can we do that? If I make another one, will that automatically apply? No, it doesn't automatically apply, but out, we can just drag it in here externally, and as it gets added to that group field, it's really easy to add additional layers into it. And it's just really nice to be able to externalize that. Just have to make sure they're all adding together. We don't need to calculate direction. We don't need to calculate color. But now those will layer and layer and layer up. So yeah, group field, way better. Oh, way better. Mm. Oh, uh, kills. That's because I haven't gotten partnered yet on Twitch. And what's funny is like I have I blew away all the norm normal numbers you need to get partnered, except it wants you to stream like two or three days a week. And I only stream from Twitch on Wednesdays. So there's like six qualifications you need to have. And I have five, but not technically doing more than one day. Um, but yeah, um, uh, I appreciate it. Um, and if you want, uh, it's better to support on Patreon because then you can get access to scene files and whatnot. But anyway, uh, and I don't have a follower alert. I don't like the, I don't like the pop-ups. It, it just is distracting from the screen. Even if it would encourage donations, that's not, uh, I don't know. I prefer that people want to support like externally to this. It drives me and I'm even trying to avoid it right now, even though I'm doing a bad job where I try and do the question and just jump in and answer it in one isolated part. Because when you're watching a present, I've been watching some different streamers doing things. And when it's ever like, Oh, blah, blah, it's like they're mid sentence. And it's like, Oh, thanks for the $25 donation. Blah, blah, blah. And then moving on, it's like they're mid sentence and they keep getting cut off and their train of thought gets very, very broken. It's very difficult to watch those. So I tend to avoid it, even though I could totally do all the overlays and it's like, Oh, blah, blah, blah. As a subscriber for the six month in a row, it's something I'm not completely against the idea, but, maybe something in the future but i like it i like it having the smoother flow for now anyway um let's see i'm not sure alan what you mean by live stream doesn't work if you're saying um can anybody sound off and make sure that youtube is still streaming properly um let's see Radius and uh, radius the best way to communicate would be jumping on the slack channel if you're not already on the rocket lasso slack and this goes for everybody if you like these questions if you like the stuff i'm up to if you have questions and you want to be a part of a community we have the rocket lasso slack channel rocket lasso slack.com and you go sign up and you join and you ask questions you answer questions everybody in there is being helpful and cool so if you're that type of person you should come and hang out um, but you can direct you can you know well i can't i, I do this live stream every every wednesday because i don't have time to answer people's questions all throughout the week. Otherwise, I'd be doing full-time tech support for free. So that's why I, I, one of the reasons I love doing the live stream is I can kind of put all those in here. But the point of Slack is everybody can communicate with everybody and you know it's really easy to share a file with someone. <sighs> anyway, 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 let's do another question. Um, David, I have an object and a displace with a vertex map. I split it up with a Voronoi then dissolve it with an effector by scaling it down. But this messes up the displacement because the Voronoi pieces. Is there a way to combine Voronoi and displacement? Um, to what degree can I understand that question? You are displacing an object and it has a vertex map and then you break it apart using a Voronoi and then you start scaling away those pieces. I mean, assuming I understand the setup you're describing, let's try and make a very basic version of this. A cube with a reasonable number of subdivisions. Make it editable. Then we can create the old vertex map. Vertex weight, cool. Now I'm assuming that you are, you're saying you're displacing it using this. That could mean a lot of things. We'll do the most basic version, which would be a displacer, which has, I, I guess you could do it into the shader and you can also do it into the fall off. So we'll try feeding into the fall off. I'm not sure how you're driving your vertex map. Let's assume that you're doing it randomly. 
via a simple random field. So now you can see that I have a random field applied. Make it large enough so we can actually see it having some sort of pattern. Hmm. Not Luca. Luca's too detailed. Let's do wavy turbulence. That's not too crazy. So you can see I've got a little something going on here. That gets fed into the displacer. And the displacer, um, that's in the fall off. So we need something to displace it. So let's just say push everything out on Y. And you can see it start to inflate. This is full power. We can increase this to whatever degree. It's not terribly subdivided. We have to do that in order to... Um, uh, create the vertex map. Now I just uh, subdivided it once. U S is the shortcut, and it's going to make four times as many polygons. That should mean it's four times as detailed. Let's not push that out too far. So let's just just assume that this is where you're at. Now using the Voronoi fracture. Oop! I think I clicked on tracer. Throw that in. It should take the resulting geometry, and yeah, it's going to break apart the resulting geometry. However, yeah, no, um, let me think. But you're saying that you then scale it apart or scale it away using an effector. So in this case, we could say a scale, not position, scale uniformly, absolutely negative one. So those should shrink down to zero and completely disappear. That works because I'm displacing what's getting fed into it. So the fracture sees that final bit of geometry, and that's what gets scaled away and disappears entirely. Now, it's all running a little bit slow because this was a... That's a lot of geometry I just threw at it. You can see, even at its kind of chuggy version here, by dragging this through... That should be fairly coherent, right? Um, some of the stuff isn't quite refreshing very smoothly. It might just be a viewport refresh. But you see the displacement seems to be consistent. So come on. Hoop. You can do it. Refresh. Yeah. So it refreshes. You see that the displacement on the outside is still there. That seems to work. So Oh, and then you put in a subdivision. Then the subdivision messes it up? That's possible. The subdivision surface causes a decent amount of trouble kind of around. the. Uh, I'm getting too much geometry on this, and it's a very specific question. And since I don't have... I mean, I, I'm not going to... Uh, one of the goals here is definitely not to just... You know, I don't ever want, you know, I'm not going to accept people's scene files for a like, oh, I'm trying to do this. Can you fix my scene file? That's not what this show is about. It's pretty much like, oh, you type out a question. And so this is fine. The point being, it's a very specific question. And I, I'm going to, it's going to be tricky for me to get the problem that you're getting. But you seem to be saying that these, I'm going to exaggerate the displacement so we can see it clearly. It's going to be a subtle well, I mean, it's, it's not a uh, very detailed displacement, but now it's not subtle. And you're saying that perhaps that gets fed into a subdivision surface. It should only subdivide it by one. And you're saying that that is then messing it up? Because once again, if that if you're doing a subdivision after the fracture, you don't want to do that. You want to feed the subdivision into the fracture. If you subdivide, subdivide it after the fact, that's going to be really funky. And then... It, this, I mean, to my knowledge, this should still be behaving correctly. It's not refreshing the smoothest thing. Actually, it's better now. So you can see, yeah, it's maintaining that uh, fine because it's just seeing the final geometry. Um, but uh, perhaps you are doing it backwards. It seems like maybe you're, that's what you're saying, that you put that in like this, and that would be really weird. I don't even know what the end result of that will be. It's super duper doing this calculation. You can see it's like kind of freaking out. It seems to be stuck in some sort of like recalculation loop. I don't even know what to make of that. I mean, it's not frozen. It's just recalculating. So I can pull it out at any point. But yeah, don't subdivide after the fact. Um, that would be pretty rough. I mean, you could potentially do that given certain circumstances. Actually, it's still, you can see it right now. It's like, won't stop calculating. I'm not sure what's up with that. But uh, yeah, okay. Well, it seems to mostly cover it. I shall check on Slack there do, do, do. holy moly 
That is not your message. Where did you send a message, Radius? Where was I? It's kind of an experiment, but we'll see how that goes. Um, is it uh, unnamed? Is it possible to use a character builder rig without skin? Ooh, that's a tricky, that's an interesting question. I mean, yes, I, mean, I have never done it before, but I do know for a fact that when it comes to the character builder in cinema, which is not something I'm, a, I'm super expert in, mostly because I like building my own characters from scratch. Like I'll rig everything completely from scratch. So if we were to build out the character, I'm holding down control as I click, so it's actually mirroring everything. So I can make the uh, hand, you go back to the uh, spine. Oh, there's a jaw. Yeah, this one's really advanced. I should have done a, is there a simple one? Let's just do a biped. So root, spine, arm, spine, leg there so it's kind of the basic character builder now technically if you go in the right mode you can get all the way down to its individual parts so right now it's displaying you can see right here it says display full visible full but the manager so the object manager here it's currently only displaying the components so it's displaying it in kind of this packaged up simplified form however if we go into that drop down we can say, show me the full hierarchy. And that is what's actually happening right there. So you can see all these different controls. So they're hiding all that away. And this is what the actual results are. But now that I have all, all I did was say, okay, display full hierarchy done. This can go into animate mode, but these are still, oh, I guess animate mode is hiding everything. Um, yeah, it's, that's where it goes to. It's one of those tools where they're trying to simplify something, and I always feel like it's trying to outsmart the user. So if you stay in one of the other modes, I'm not sure which is a good mode. Even that, uh, it keeps setting it back. It's trying to, yeah, it's trying to outsmart us. If we leave it in this full hierarchy, you should be able to build whatever object you want and use maybe constraint tags. Because these objects all are there. They're just not being displayed. I don't have a specific example, but if let's just make a... So here's like a new leg bone, or here's where I want the I want this to go wherever that leg is. So if I were to create this cube, add a rigging constraint tag, lock it to the PSR of, and I can even do this pick picker, move it over here and say, blink. Oh, mm, that seems to have jumped up to the parent. So let's not do that. Uh, I can manually do this. That component, oh, when you select it, it's automatically jumping up. I think that's actually a character component thing where if we select something, it's going to jump it to a particular parent, which is pretty cool. But once again, it's outsmarting the user. It might have something to do with one of these. I'm not sure. But we should still be able to click on these individual controls. So we see a leg. That's the foot control. Here's the spine roots. Inside the spine, you have a hip, and there's our leg. So as I select these individual joints, now you can actually see they're going. So that is what I want to link to. So L, knee, int. Turn that on. Drag that in. And now it should be locked to that. Now, actually, what I usually do is put this in the null. Put that constraint tag on the null. And now this cube is free to move around as I please as a child. So let's just say that's the leg. Hopefully, I don't know, but now I've locked that on to the character. Going from object to animate, everything will disappear. Our leg is still there. It's external to it. However, if I were to grab the leg, then yeah, you can see that that is going anywhere that that joint went um, on the character. And we are able to control it via that version of the rig. Technically, you see it's lagging one frame behind. It, it took that one frame, so we have to change the order of operations. I don't know what the calculation order on these are, but if we say this should calculate, I don't know, let's just say Expresso 50. That's just a pure guess. 
if I had to move that and hit undo, yeah, now you see it jumped. So it's the proper order now. Now it would be a little bit tedious to link all those things. And I don't know if it could be fully exploded, but I mean, it is all, ultimately it's all built out of ind individual pieces and it would be entirely possible to yank all of those components out from the character stuff, like yank out these various character components. If we started removing these tags, then it would just live as this larger component and it doesn't need to be a child of all these different things. Back when they were like beta testing this, I was part of the beta and I started trying to build not you not use our character tag, but build a rig to go into the character builder. So I went like super overboard and I effectively haven't used it since. So apologies for that, but um do 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 um Let's see. Oh, in Rocket Doc. Okay, let me try. Uh, somebody's trying to help out, and I want to see if this ends up working. Um, careful about posting things. Uh, yeah, the Rocket Doc is like just the invite place. But let me check this out. Hair pose. If you'll give me a moment. Uh, underwear bullets. Pull this over here. Download. Open containing folder. Open up the hair pose more file that was sent over by Radius. I uh, used Octane, so Octane is now yelling at me because I don't have a login. And it's also opening an R20, not R22. That's not helping me much. And Octane won't stop yelling at me. There we go. Get rid of that. Yeah, this is where it's tricky to do this type of thing, but I'm always open to the experiment. I'll try it in R20. All right, so we've got this. And you're saying you did get it to morph. Um, tag. It's not an animate mode. It's cloning. You have a whole lot of individual hairs. I mean, you made it editable, so each of those is its own individual hair. You're saying that this is morphing onto presumably one of these. Yeah, it's linked to that one, which is, which one is it? Oh, wait, it's linked to itself and it's not linked to anything else. I'm mad. Uh, yeah, um, we could talk about it later, but as far as on stream, I'm not entirely following what you have here. And you, you made it editable, so everything becomes its own individual hair, which is uh, maybe a little more destructive than I, I would want to go. Um, let's see. Uh, unnamed. It's possible you could drop it in there, but when it comes to rigs, it's always dangerous to, to make things directly of children because you never know how they built the rig. Like, the rig might be saying, like, find the next object. That will be the control. And if you put a, suddenly put a cube in there then it's like, oh, there's my control. But the cube was never supposed to be the control. So it's a dangerous thing. I'm still super curious why. You can see in my cinema how it, this is constantly doing a little calculation. I'm not sure what's up with that uh, as a fracture. Calm down, fracture. Calm down. Travis, uh, I don't like the, uh, this might be too much for a stream caveat. That seems dangerous, but let's give it a try. Um, Let's see. How would you create this type of mechanical ball that opens up when thrown in the air and is forced back together when it lands? Oh, I bet you I know what this is. Oh, well, it's not exactly, but I have seen this before. Oh, uh, I have seen it before. I have absolutely no idea how this works mechanically. There's a lot of mechanics that are going to be happening on the inside. Nope, oh, thank you. Oh, wait, now it's a different video, but let's... Uh... I mean, the slow-mo is very nice, but... The, um, oh, I'm pushing the wrong button. I was like, why is my frame by frame not working? Because I'm not pushing frame by frame. Yeah, you can see there's a lot of mechanical things happening in here. Like, look at the geometry of the shape. Like, really kind of crazy and advanced. I thought um, you were going to link to something like this. Uh, how do I find it? Um, Actually, let's just search for expanding ball toy. Um, yeah, I thought you were going to link to one of these. Uh, whole, 
uh, Hoberman sphere. Mm, yeah, these are pretty neat. Yeah. Mechanically speaking, I can almost imagine making something like this, but honestly, not really. Yeah, Travis, um, if, if I actually could see the toy, like, dismantled, but a lot of these, I have to just use my intuition for how something is mechanically working and something like that. It's the mechanics of it are very hidden inside the geometry and possibly interior mechanisms. And I just don't know what it looks like inside, so I can't guess. Um, um, hmm... But yeah, even this. I mean, I'm not going to answer my own question on that. But the um, when it comes to something like this, you know the uh, you know those really fun like grabber toys where you like pinch it in and then like the accordion type of layout would would grab at the end. I think that these are that same idea, just curved. Like one size is a little bit shorter than the other ones. But even I don't. I mean, I've tinkered with those, but I've never not in three. I've I played with them in real life. I've never tried to do anything with those in 3D. So I don't have a good intuition for that. Um, uh, apparently Leo had a question. Where's Leo's question? Oh, there. Um, can you use fields to trigger different materials? Um, why wouldn't you be able to, um, use fields to trigger different materials by trigger materials? I figure you just mean, oh, well, yeah, let's uh, take a look. I can think of several different approaches to something like this. So. Let's make a figure, explode the figure into all of its pieces. And actually, what's even better is I want to explode this out with a, out its hierarchy. So this will be silly, but I'll put it into a connect object. Don't weld. So now you see it's a single polygon object. Selecting it all, we can right click. Actually, I don't think it's in this menu. But if I hit Shift C, type in explode. Nope, not explode. Oh, fine. I'll just find it as a tool. Tool. No, mesh. Add, no, not clone, conversion. Yeah, polygon groups to objects. It's explode spines, polygon groups to objects. And that will explode that into its individual components. So now it's just a big pile of objects. La la. Okay. Like I said, a silly way of doing that. But now I've got one object with a lot of different shapes. So let's just assume that we want to colorize these using fields. Now, the fields can only affect clones. We need to affect clones somehow. So the there's two the two basic ways we can kind of convert something that's not a MoGraph object into a MoGraph object is using the fracture object or the Voronoi fracture object. The fracture is essentially like, oh, I'm a cloner, except my clones are just literally my children. So well, this should be a straight thing where it's, immediately taking each piece and it's applying clone like effects onto it. Now, a couple thoughts. One is this can be field driven however we want to. So using a plane will be our conduit into it. So put a position. Now that can receive fall offs. So if that were to say have a linear field, that could do whatever transition we want. And it can receive its color from the gradient. Let's say it's a gradient. And that being a gradient, we could even say a preset, I think. Yeah, load preset. Let's get a nice looping rainbow. Now we have a rainbow. And this rainbow is based off this linear field. So whichever direction I move it, those individual pieces are going to be fully colored in, though. So that's directly changing entire segments or pieces into a specific color. Now, that, that's making that a specific color. Now, you were talking a little bit more about a material. And so I'll save this as a standalone because we'll we'll we're going to take a couple of approaches here as we say different ways of applying color to things. Um, materials via fields. 
So that's one kind of basic approach. And that color is coming directly from the field. As an alternative, that could be a, uh, I guess we're colorizing it, that's fine. The color remap, it could be a gradient. Let's just feed it a generic uh, black to white. Actually, they got rid of the generic black to white, but we can just click on that. And actually, I guess it fades via an alpha, which is interesting. I don't want that though. Edit alpha. Nope. Oh, oh wait, yeah, it's fading out. <laughs> yeah, it, I'm trying to think of the proper way. They, this, they came. I, I clicked on a preset that had an alpha built in, and it's tripping me up because I, I never have a good intuition for these alphas. So to tell you the truth, I'm just gonna click on a regular one, and then do that. Now we actually have control over it. It's fading out, but we have complete control over how that color is applying. I do believe even if we set that to a base color of red, it's getting completely overridden by the white and the black. So now this fall off is creating some sort of fall off in there. And that means a material applied to the fracture object can be driven via the, let's use the luminance channel, via the MoGraph color shader. The MoGraph color shader could uh, it's looking at the color and translating this into cinema. So this is now literally those colors. It's now in the luminance channel. But of course, that can drive various things. So inside of, let's use a very basic version, a fusion channel, the fusion could use that as a mask. So let's turn on a mask, drive this into the mask channel and say, we want this to transition from a noise to a gradient. I don't know if that's a good idea. Let's just do two different types of noise. Two blatantly different types of noise. It'd probably be a nice idea to turn on the high quality noises. And now you can see we get a nice preview of the way that that transition is happening. And if this is working well, we should be able to even, yeah, you can see as I move this, that each object is transitioning that. That's not two different materials, but you can see how we can use this to manipulate what material goes through. So you could, in theory, build your materials via a series of masks like this. Or if you did want different materials, then I suppose this could just be, let's feed in the noise. And inside of the alpha channel, that could be fed our very nice color shader. So that becomes an alpha channel. Let's make it not pre-multiplied. Do we need soft? I was, it's a, I always forget how these work. Well, yeah, okay, so that's alpha-ing out of that, and now you can see where those are applied. If I were to apply two materials to this, hopefully, we should see, yeah, let's make, make it a little more blatant. This can be a bright red, and now you can see that as we allow this to transition, we're actually applying it via the alpha channel, getting masked out. And this alpha channel technically should have a nice smooth fall off. You just can't see it in the viewport. It's asking a lot of cinema to do this type of transparency. So let's turn on transparency. Do we get anything? No. But I think if I hit render, actually, this does seem rather black and white, doesn't it? Maybe that's because I turned on soft or off soft. Let's get, turn on soft, and that might actually give us... Oh, yeah, okay. And then we invert. There. Now it does give us that nice smooth transition. So depending on how I use this linear field, I could pinch this in really tight. So there's pretty much not a transition or it can make it really long and it can softly transition from one to the other object per object as well. So that's kind of neat. It, yeah, it is object to object. So that's a second method of doing something sort of along those lines. Now, a third one that jumped to mind, I don't know if this will work. Yeah, this is going to be the weirdest one. Um, delete the fracture, remake the figure from scratch. Bake the figure down into one object. I don't want to weld, though, just in case it welds some pieces together. So single object. I don't use this very often. However, can we do this? Actually, I actually don't. I know that we can do it. I just never have done it. We can set a selection tag. But what's cool about a selection tag here is we can use fields. So this is using a field. That field can directly drag in the linear. We don't even need the plane anymore. So we're using this linear field. So 
this red material can be applied to the entire character, but we say, no, 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 that's only applied to wherever this polygon selection is. And this linear field now is going to actually update our polygon selection. And I can see those polygons actually get drawn on as it goes through. And this could apply to as many different materials as you want to. So if that were, that's this red, let's make a second one, maybe a nice purpley color. Apply that one, create a second selection tag, a second, well, mm, I'll limit this to the second one. Actually, we should name it differently. So we'll keep it simple, polygon selection two. That will link to polygon selection two. And it polygon selection two will not use a linear field. It will use a spherical field. Keep in mind the way that these stack on top of each other. So purple comes after. So anywhere I move this, this will override. You can see that now... There's nothing, and then red, and then purple. And the purple layer is always on top. So if I had to move the purple down here, and I start trying to move the red, the linear, down to override the purple, that won't happen, because the red is underneath the purple. So keep in mind that layering. But now you can see on a polygon per polygon basis, we can drive literally what material is applied where, which is, I think, a pretty powerful thing, which I've literally never done. But that is cool. There's a, I'm, I don't know, I gotta see, I kind of contacted Max on about it. I haven't gotten a response yet, but I recently ran into something that I was like, whoa, this could be really powerful and it's not working. I feel like there might be a bug because maybe literally no one ever tried to use it that way. And let's see if we can make it do anything just out of curiosity. Here's, here's kind of the concept. I'll keep it as simple as possible. We'll use a plane. It doesn't get much more simple than that. So there's a couple polygons on here. What if we were to add a, a vertex map? I wish you could get a vertex map by right clicking, but it's not here. I don't think it's here. Nope. And vertex maps are so much more important. So I really wish it was here, but we have to go into selection, set vertex weight. So, okay, vertex weight, done. Here's an interesting thing. If we were to, in our vertex weight tag, turn it on, the vertex map um, let's see, it's not, oh, maybe it's, okay, it's actually not in the regular vertex map. <laughs> oh, that one came quick. Thank you. Um, Mohammed, thank you very much. I am doing very well. Likewise, I hope. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. Can I report, or how do I get rid of this? Um, report. Um, where's spam? Spam. Next. Possibly a bot. Just submit. And then... Boom. Block. Block. Okay. The spammer is gone from Twitch. Hopefully gone. It's hard to tell. Yeah, they're blocked. So they can't do any more. Anyway. Um, sorry. Uh, what we need is a vertex color map. I don't know. We, I don't think we do anything here. I think it's just a limitation. But let me show you other tags, color vertex. So I got really excited the other day when I discovered a vertex color map is it has a mode. Currently, vertex colors are set to points only, and points only means that we can like paint on it. We can paint these different things. And you see, every time I point paint a point, it creates a transition from that point to the points around it. It's a smooth gradient from one side to the other. That's pretty cool. Gives us a lot of power. However, if we change the mode from points only to polygon points, then every polygon uniquely has four points around it. It's very different. If I were to paint right now, you're gonna see it looks exactly the same. However, if I were to select a polygon, if I select some polygons, let's select that one and let's select those third, let's select that. Now, if I go, and you see the tag changed as well. If I were to paint on this now, I can only, oh, let me paint, actually let's double click and make sure I restrict to selected only. Now that we're in polygon points mode, when I start painting, you'll see that that can be painted by itself. Because now one point isn't one point, each polygon has an individual like instance of that point. So now you can see I can paint this like that. So it's a little bit more like a selection tag, but it's with color. And I was like, whoa, that's really cool. And it does work as far as this is concerned. 
but I can't make it do anything interesting. Every time I tried to do something really cool with it, it didn't really work. Now, technically this does work with fields as well, but well, it actually does it because as soon as I change it to fields, you see how they suddenly blurred out. So it's like, I don't know, it just doesn't quite work. Let's try a linear field. Yeah, and immediately I see it not working because it, yeah, the same thing is happening. It's not on a point by point basis, but it's like, oh, that could have been cool, but it's still doing the transition. So pretty much a dead end. But if they could get that, if they if that worked the way I expect it to work, that would be really cool and give us a lot of new opportunities. Um, was there anything else to say about this material thing? Um, can you drive, how do you drive? Um, there's one last thought, but I almost never use this one. There is the MoGraph multi shader and the multi shader would be the ability to feed in not different materials, but you could feed in different textures and that could be driven via the index or like the color as well. And they added this add from folder button, which is amazing. So you could have a folder with like 50 images and you just click and it'll automatically add 50 channels, each with each one. So you have like uh, the 52 playing cards and then it'll automatically create this. And via using like a, the proper combination of effectors, you could clone 52 cards and have each one have its own unique material via clones. Um, of course, like I said, it's not full material. It would just be feeding in a different T image texture to each one but having said that you could imagine you know you could make a super material that has 50 different images but then 50 different um, gradient maps fed into a different channel it is a lot of different power yeah leo yeah exactly uh, cards is like the ultimate example of like i have 50 images like how do i do it well playing cards i'll do it but you, you also have 52 images of cats and then have 52 different cat images going um yeah, that goes back a long ways. I just don't use it very often, but when you need it, that's really powerful. So that's sort of a fourth way, but this covers the three ways that I can think to use fields to drive uh, like kind of what material is where. This one being the most specific, but of course you lock yourself in a bit when it comes to these types of things. We could mask it out. You can use a vertex map, obviously, which has a more of a smooth fall off, and that's could be an alpha channel and you could control that and then layer those up. But then you do have to start dragging the individual vertex maps in into the material. And I think there might still be a bug where you can only use one vertex map with fields per object right now, which is super frustrating. Yeah, or pages of a book or a magazine. Yeah, exactly. That type of stuff is perfect. Um, the variation shader. You know what, Pierre? I am, I gotta like, honestly, the, the variation shader is one that has always just utterly baffled me. I have never been able to figure out the variation shader to any sort of satisfaction. Like I've been talking about this a lot lately in the bonus streams, and I just cannot make this thing work in any way that seems logical to me. I'm able to like randomly colorize the polygons and things like that, but why is it not showing up? I turn on polygons. Well, I'm not going to worry about it, but you know, like the ability to apply this, you have to do change so many sliders to make it properly apply. And I don't know. It, it, I wish it did more. I wish it worked from poly. If you, this had a drop down that said polygon groups or segments, oh, I would use it all the time, but it doesn't have that. I don't think it has a very good default setting. The, these default settings are not very good. Uh, yeah, that should hopefully wrap that one up. Actually, we're right on time. Let's see if there's anything simple to tackle. Otherwise, uh, there's always a lot to do. I'm trying to catch up on notes for some... My brothers have been coding away, and one of my brothers caught up to all my notes, and uh, I've been trying to catch up and get him more notes to continue working on the tools. Uh, Pro Tools, excellent question. Um, how much longer is this season going to go? Oh, I forgot... I just realized by looking at the camera, I completely forgot to turn on the lights in the background today. Um, how long is the season going to be? I haven't strictly decided. Um, if I had to make a guess right now, let's say like five more. So uh, the better part of a month and a half. And that seems to be about when we would usually cut off. This will be a quite a few episodes. 35 is a lot for a season. But it would be really, it gets to a point where it'd be really nice as I'm trying to get some tools out there, maybe record some training series to potentially sell. It'd be nice to 
not have this. It takes a long time to, well, first of all, prep for this, record this, edit it, get it uploaded, put it on Patreon. There's a lot of steps to it. So having several more days of free time in a week for working is just good for me to be able to focus. And I like the idea of breaking things up in the seasons. So right now, I'm not I'm not locking in, but let's say around 35. So who knows? Maybe 35, 36 is my plan. Um, let's see. That is sort of the plan, but thanks for asking. Uh, Crossfader apparently has a question that somebody is seconding. Uh, and you even copied the question, so thank you. Uh, how do we go about creating a group, uh, a cloned group of characters walking as a grid of people, like specifically a grid of people? How do we make a group of cloned characters walking as a grid of people over an uneven surface? Um, well, first of all, I don't have any way of making their feet stick. So you could you could fake it just by having them travel properly along the surface. Um, The, um, the, the problem here goes to, yeah, like when it comes to actually proper crowd, crowd simulation, you tend to start needing something like Massive, which was like software written for giant movies. What movie was that actually written for? It wasn't actually written for Lord of the Rings, was it? It's possible that it was, but I thought it might have predated that. Um, where essentially it's a full-on video game engine, and every time a character takes a step, it's not just like an animation. It's dynamically placing everything exactly where it belongs. So that's really tricky. Now, do we, oh, well, I mean, let's spend, I mean, this is something it's, I understand it well enough that we can tinker. Let me open up a proper window here and go to Mixamo. And let's, let's get a, let's grab a character that's walking and see what we can get. Um, I The feet will not be placed. Of course, it logged me out. Log in. Continue. Yes. All right. So let's grab, let's go to characters, pick something simple. Here's generic dude. Actually, I always like the construction worker. Yeah, I'm not liking that. Let's go with the construction worker. Worker. Aha. Pete. Let's go with Pete. I like Pete. I guess this is made of several objects, which slows things down a little bit, but that's fine. Now, let's just... Uh, I don't want... Okay, the search... <laughs> bad design. The uh, search bar translates from both of them. Uh, now, I just want a simple walk. Ooh, let's get a march. Somebody said a bunch of soldiers, so we'll do that. Search for a march. Are you going to search? Is it... The it's quite confused by the word march. All right, we'll just find our own then. Strut walking. So far, strut walking is the best bet. Yeah, I don't want to take too long, so we'll do strut walking. Hopefully, that's just a nice walk, uh, looping walk. Now I've lost strut walking. There it is. Aha. Uh -huh. Do, 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 do. Yeah, that's fine. Um, okay. So, download. Everything can stay default. If you have uh, an Adobe account, then I think you automatically get access to Mixamo.com. And this will take a little bit. The file will be not too huge, 62 megs. So that's downloading. When it's done, I will drag it into Cinema. Uh, yep, Pimp Construction Worker. <laughs> Ed, Ed is saying that Massive was as fun as editing databases. Not surprising. The, uh, the, the like the like the world of making video games. It's not like you're playing video games. You're just writing code. So 
It's not like you magically are just doing this fun thing. So the idea of a very mechanical, huge scale um, thing, like video game engine, something like massive. It's not surprising that's not exactly fun. All right, we import that as default. It comes in automatically as a take. So selecting mixamo.com. I believe we need mixamo.com. Right click on it. Actually, don't right click. Click on it. File, current take to new document. That opens up a new file in Cinema, which will unlock all of our options. This is the entire character, dragging it and putting it into the null. If we hit play, the character should walk forward. If we give ourselves a lot more time, it's probably gonna terminate. So then we need to loop it. Oh man, I have, I'm not an expert on this stuff. Um, window, timeline. Probably timeline. Can we convert this to a... I don't use motion clips. I haven't used motion clips in like seven years. So that seems dangerous. Can I just say after we could repeat? Let's try offset repeat. Kind of a generic... Uh, Go to it. I wouldn't be surprised if it goes nuts as soon as it goes past. Hey, it was simple as, oh no, it stopped. It seemed to work for a moment there. It seemed to go twice as far. Oh, repeat repetitions, uh, zero. Zero repetitions means infinite repetitions. And there we go, now he walks forever. Wow, I thought that'd be a lot harder. Okay, so he's gonna keep on repeating that motion and it's offset, so he'll keep on going forward. We do not need to see these joints so he'll just keep on walking now the very basic version of the question was let's say we had an army of these and oh that's interesting why are they t-posed um that's interesting um create a multi-instance why i thought we could just clone those it's just a baked animation, right? Curious. Um, I'm going to bake it as a Lembic. Uh, 999 frames. It's a lot. Let's see how quick it goes, though. Let's see. Oh, it's just a null. That doesn't seem to help anything. Mm. That I could still probably make this work. What if we put into a connect? Don't weld, so that's being merged down all into one object. Can that be baked as an Olympic? Definitely slower. Uh, Flavio? Uh, it was not in multi-instance when I first made it, and it didn't work. I tried moving it to multi-instance. Uh, Eric, yeah, Mixamo is super easy to move over. Oh, oh you mean for the looping. Um, and yeah, the repetitions, all that works pretty well. Pretty well. Um, bake's not taking too long. And there could easily be a way of fixing this, but uh, the, I'm not that concerned with this particular part of the process. The um, I just I just need a character that's going to walk and actually play back in the cloner. So this seems like a good way of making that happen. Baking this out to a limbic and a connect should treat it all as one object. Even if the materials go away, that I'm, I'm fine with that just for our purposes of answering this question. All right, it seems to have given us something. Um, hide that. Well, it did kill the materials, but we do have a character. Can Does he work if I drop the material on? Oh, yeah, okay, nice. So I dropped the material on and he suddenly come, came back in. I, yeah, maybe the UV we do need, but the faces I don't need, the normals I don't need. Put that into a cloner and there we go now. We have an army of them strutting along. Dump, but dump, but dump. I wonder if we can, can you parametrically offset them? This starts feeling dangerous. I'm gonna save the scene file. However, um, I can't I can't distribute the Alembic files, so this will not be included in the uh, Patreon scene files. They look a little, <laughs> okay, I was like, why does he look so fuzzy? Well. The beard is a different material, so it's definitely messed up that up, but that's fine. He can have a he can have a beard of his entire image. So we have this army. Now the question was, can we offset them? Because if I say five, then there's a little bit of an offset. So if I put two of them in there, 
and I say that one of them has an offset of five. And yeah, now I think, yeah, now there, there's two different, do you see how there's two different uh, versions of them that they're offset a little bit? His animation was technically like 41 frames, wasn't it? Something like that. So now there's, they're way offset. Maybe I should say negative 41. I guess they'll get ahead of themselves a little bit. So I don't know how far we should push it, but let's see if I can, those are multi instances and I probably do want multi instances, but can I blend? They go, they all go back in sync if I blend. However, if we turn off multi instance, then now all of them should have their own unique offset. And you can see we actually get a nice bit of variation in there. I just want to throw that out there as an option. Now, even having said that, we can go back to multi instance. And if we don't offset these too much to make it too blatant, we could just put in like, let's say four of them. And we'll have one be offset by five, one be offset by 10, one be offset by 15, and the last one will be the zero. So there should be at least four different variations of them. So they're not all perfectly in sync, just for fun. So there we go, we get our grid. Now it's multi-instance. This is where it gets things get super nuts, is because it's multi-instance, even with four different characters all baked as a Lembic, I can hit play in the viewport and this is running in real time. Multi-instance is so crazy like look at uh look at this instant uh ridiculousness i think uh they're probably these are very even counts so if i do an odd number they might uh not be the uh well maybe they aren't lined up there's different types but that's oh we're in blend let's try randomizing there we go now they're all slightly different ones now they won't be identical so now we get that giant grid. I just want to throw that out there because it was really cool. Let's simplify again. And now let's see if we can get them working on an un walking on an uneven ground. So um, what was I actually going to do here? Um, well, you'd have to, you can't... Um, If we, here's a, here's a, here's kind of a cheaty way to do it. I'm not sure what the uneven ground is, but check this out. This should be really easy. I'm going to make a ground that's pretty subdivided like that. And it's not super subdivided, but it's got a pretty decent number of subdivisions. Okay. Now, what if I displace this with a plane? So feed in a plane. And the plane will be offsetting on Z. Let's go pretty extreme, 300. It's a deformer, a point deformer. And the fall off will be varied via random field. So that gives us this crazy texture map. That'll look better if we make it huge. Let's try another wavy turbulence and make it 10 times larger. Nope, still not big enough. 10 times larger. There we go. We start getting a little bit of terrain. Uh, I'll cut it in half just for fun. Yeah, so we get some this type of thing. Okay, so we have now have an uneven terrain, but this is being driven via a very specific procedural random field. So, what if we feed the cloner a second? This is pushing up on Y, and how much was that pushing? This was pushing three hundred. So on Y, we'll push up three hundred. The fall off will be based on that same random noise. So now they should all be pushed up the exact same amount that the dirt is, the ground is, and they're just being moved up and down based on that deformation. So when we hit play and they move forward, do they? No, they seem to be walking right through it because their position, oh, their position, that makes sense. Their position hasn't changed. Their original origin hasn't changed. Um, dang, that it works on the first frame, so I got excited there. But it, then it doesn't work. So what can we do about this? I'm trying to think of a way of sticking the axis to. This is definitely something in cinema that seems to have stopped working. It's It seems to not work that well. Why is this cloner already getting a... Maybe, well, is that a thing? If you have a, I always knew that if you have a cloner selected and you create an effector, it's automatically applied. But if you have an effector and you create a cloner, it's automatically applied as well. That's interesting. Can I clone that 
matrix onto an object and the object will be this cloner and I want to clone onto the axis of each object. This has not been working and I swear it's a bug. Maybe I lost my mind, but you'll see that even if I make those huge, that it's not cloning on there. So it doesn't work. Um, yeah, they're all just getting offset in space. So does this turn into, we actually want the characters to not move. We want the, the original character should be walking in place and then we move them after the fact. Like their feet would be sliding because like, yeah, their feet would just be constantly sliding. That wouldn't be great. Um, uh, I can't deform. This is going to be here. I'm gonna, mm, can we deform the geometry? That seems dangerous, but let's see what happens. Uh, if I, for fun, I drop that in. And I make this transform space based on the effector. And I want to push up 300 on Y. And we turn off that one so this is not good this is probably going to be really ugly but what i'm doing oh wait i want that one i don't want that one okay <laughs> yeah it's it's horrible so what i'm doing now is i am deforming the actual the entirety of the character's geometry actually it doesn't even seem to line up very well maybe oh yeah it's probably the random field probably needs to be infinite vertically so put a couple of zeros on there Oh, no, he still goes in the ground. It's based on the effector. Relative, let's say it's absolute. Oh, daw. Oh, dear. Yeah, it was never going to work anyway, but the thought was like just deforming them individually up. Oh, it's going to run real slow as well. And that could have moved them up and down. Doesn't seem to work. And deforming the geometry after the fact. I'm impressed it's doing it at all, given that the fact it's a multi-instance, but... I mean, the simple, like I said, the there's a the simple version of this that I think would just pretty much work would be if these characters weren't self animating, if they were staying in place, walking in place, which you can do. You can take that from XMO, walking in place, and just animating them forward via like some sort of constant. Then that would be passing through this this cloud. But right now, their individual axis have not changed. They're still, as far as these objects are concerned, are still in their original location. So they only look good on that first little bit when they're standing on that terrain already. Um, and because their axis is never, it's never moving with them. Yeah, um, I guess that's... That, that would be the only way to do it because you need... We can only manipulate the final geometry or the axis. They are moving off of their axis, which means the axis is just not valid here. So they have to be not animating. So we could then animate via the axis. If they were doing that, then it would be pretty simple to put together, even if their feet would look a little bit like they're sliding. Like not a lot. If we match the speed pretty well, but the foot right now, a foot will plant, stay there until it lifts back up again. But this alternative method, the foot would kind of plant and keep sliding forward as kind of one continuous movement and that wouldn't uh you know that that could look okay from a, dis a distance or from the correct angle um but it won't work if they're moving uh yeah use grass to cover up their feet that would work um so yeah i'm trying to think if there's anything i could do that would get around that but i mean it, it I think it goes to like those two principles I just said. Like you, you can move the axis via cloners and effectors, but given our current setup, that's not an option. And then you can deform geometry, and this is not uh, this is not liking the deforming geometry. Actually, I, I don't know why it didn't like what I did there. I'm going to, even though it's not going to work very well, like this will not look good. But I, why did my experiment not work there? I think it would. I'm going to simplify, make slightly fewer of them. And we use a displacer because it's just old and I'm familiar with it. Push up. Let's just say I want to constantly have full power. And that's kind of fun right there. Um, it looks like there's like a comic strip that has this type of looking construction worker, like a Ziggy type of thing. 
Anyway, uh, I want to push up not on the vertex, but based on the plane. And the plane shall be Y plus. So they should get pushed upward, hopefully. Yeah, so you see them get pushed up. So I don't want this cloner to have this built-in effector. That goes away. So they're all on the ground. And this displacer should be pushing them up in the air 300. 300 with a fall-off restricted to that same random field. And that should push them in a very deformed way. See, this is what's confusing me. In the random field, we already really stretched out the Y, which should make it infinite. But now it's doing the exact same thing, where they're being offset not as if they're in the same noise field. Yeah, I don't know what to make of that exactly. Yeah, yeah, the exact same slowdown, the exact same weirdness. And even if it worked, which it's not, then we would get this type of problem where he'd be they'd be stretching based on the terrain that they're working on. So that would only work in the most subtle of terrain changes. Um, just for a just to show you the proof of concept, the um, let's yank out our construction worker and just to show you the principle of it for fun, make a figure, and the figure already pivots from the ground, which is nice. We don't need the displacer. It will be offset on Y. So now you can see that they're all standing correctly on the terrain. And but it, because it's their axis, if we were, honestly, even if we were to just take this plane, you see if I take the cloner and I move it, do you see how they're moving up and down and they're staying on the terrain? So that we can do that where we can see this easily will stay in that same location. Bing, 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 bing. Um, yeah, they'll stay in that location, but it will not individually calculate it. Um, the, uh, I guess the individual, especially with the way I did the connector bake, the, um, I was thinking of if we took just a single person, but you can see right here, here's the problem. The axis doesn't change. The axis is staying in the same spot. So if we went back to... Did I override the file? Well, we got the original strut walk. If I click on this, you can actually see that this, we are moving along a little bit. So uh, that would create a feedback loop. How do I do that? Um, we could potentially put this entire thing into a group and then that group, but it would have to move along the character. It just goes back to the same problem. They did, he'd have to be in a particular spot. Technically, I think they're supposed to be like in the character builder and the character tools that they have. It's supposed to have some sort of automatic like foot placement where it does match it. It's a super old school tutorial like Cineversity thing. But yeah, that kind of completes my thought on that. It's a neat question. I'm glad we got the big army of people. And now how easy you can just grab a couple of them, do a big multi instance, still get them to have variation, which is pretty cool. Um... But yeah, that's as far as I could think to go right now. So sorry that uh, that doesn't go any further, but I think we hit the meat of what it had that it was kind of capable of. So go to the proper window here. I completely lost my streaming software. There it is. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. We answered the extra question. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming and hanging out. If you like this kind of content, you want to get access to the scene files of the things we are saving today, you can join on Patreon. Rocket Lasso has a Patreon setup. You get the scene files. I also have been doing bonus streams on Thursday, on two, you know, well, Thursdays and Tuesdays, but better to say Tuesdays and Thursdays. So I'm going to grab just a link to the Rocket Lasso Patreon. In addition to that, I mentioned earlier, we do have the Rocket Lasso Slack channel that you should head over to, which is rocketlassoslack.com. Patreon, Patreon, Rocket Lasso. I did mean that. Boop. So here's a link to that for anyone who might be interested, but these live streams, these Rocket Lasso Live live streams are going to be free. I've been doing tutorials every week and probably going to be more on every other week. And um, just to keep the pace up. Like I said, I'm starting to fall behind on notes on plugins and whatnot that we're working on. But that should wrap it up. Thank you, everybody, so much for hanging out and asking lots of good questions and helping answer the different questions. I'll see you on the Slack channel. I'll see you in the bonus streams. I'll see you next week for Rocket Lasso Live. Goodbye, everybody. Adios. And to do.